Hi guys, welcome to another Monday night study. We're going through the book of Enoch and comparing it to things. So far, what we've done is we gave a brief introduction the first week. Last week, we looked at chapters one through five. And chapter one is all about the end time prophecy that we see uh, mentioned in Jude about the Lord coming with 10,000s of his saints. And that we, we said was a direct quote. And chapters two through five were an explanation of things. Basically, just like Peter, when he says, if these things are coming to pass or will come to pass, what manner of godliness should we do? So the concept that everything's always the same, nothing changes. And if God said there will be two uh, ends of the world, two destructions, and the first one happened and everything like the seasons continue just as they were prophesied this will be too so we need to be holy so that's kind of where we ended now today we want to start the section on nephilim history and that's chapters 6 through uh, i believe 18 or 16. we're just going to look at chapters 6 7 and 8 and we are going to um, see how it began and we're going to take little breaks in that as we go through the rest of the chapters in that section. We're going to come back and see what the church fathers said about it, just so that we know that it's accurate history um, as far as Christianity goes, ancient Christianity. So first, let's look at this. And let's start off by looking at our scriptures. And we looked at this last week. This is uh, my e-sword. And this is Jude. And when we get to... Uh, verse 6, <clears throat> he's talking about uh, the examples of people that were godly that fell. Uh, verse 5 is about those that left Egypt and some of them didn't believe and were destroyed. The angels, which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness to the judgment of the great day. Just like Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities, and then he goes on from there. Now, first off, this word here, habitation, we tend to look at that as like they left where they lived and they moved. So they moved down here, just like you would move to a different city. That's not exactly what this word means. Habitation means the, the mode of living. So they actually changed. Um, in Clement's memoirs, we'll see later in the early church, uh, Clement mentions that Peter explained it by saying it was a metamorphosis. These were angels like they know what we know about angels. Matter of fact, that's one of the examples of, uh, or one of the objections to Genesis 6. How could angels cohabitate with women? Well, there was a metamorphosis. And he explains it very well, I think, in, in that particular place. But they left their estate or the way they were. They changed not just location, but what they were in some way. <clears throat> and so this is different than Satan and the fallen angels. And it goes on talking. When we get down to verse um, 14, he says, and we, we talked about this. This is the end of chapter 1 where uh, Jude is quoting from this. Enoch said, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly uh, among them of all their ungodly needs, which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches, which the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. And he goes on and talks about other things. So he quotes part of chapter 1, and then back up here in verse 6, he refers to chapters 6 through 18. Now, with that in mind, I'm going to hop over to uh second peter and i want to show you something here second peter 2 uh, a lot of people have debated whether second peter 2 is quoting jude or jude is quoting second peter or they're both quoting some other document so that doesn't really matter for us but he starts off by saying kind of the same thing there were false prophets also among those people just like there will be false teachers among you We've all got to guard against that. People, weird people coming into our church. Some weird pastors, weird deacons, you know. Uh, so it says, these people will privately bring in damnable heresies. 
So this is not a, a debate on whether we should have a blue carpet or a red carpet, which doesn't really matter in any way, shape or form. But it's something that if you follow the false teacher, the false prophet, you are not a Christian. Now, I'm not saying you can lose your salvation, but I'm talking about cults. If you uh, are thinking about becoming a Christian and you wind up going to a cultic church, you're never going to get saved. I mean, it's just it's that dangerous. It's a damnable heresy. Heresy basically just means a division. So you and I can have a difference of an opinion as long as we don't divide over it. We're not heretics uh, when we divide over it. That's the problem. Uh, so they do this, this damnable heresy, even to the point of denying the Lord that bought them. So in this church or in this cult, they would deny that Jesus or the Messiah's blood atonement does anything. So they're definitely not saved. And they will bring upon themselves a swift destruction. Many who will follow their pernicious ways, and by their reason, truth will be evil spoken of. He goes on and says, um, uh, through covetousness, they just do this for through greed. They want your money, in other words. Uh, they will say with feigned words and make merchandise of you, whose judgment is now of a long time that lingers not, and their damnation slumbers not. So they will be judged, and if they don't repent and become real believers, they will be damned. So verse 4 is what we want to get to, and this is interesting. So he begins to talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels, the pre-flood world, the different people that did things. He says, for God spared not the angels that sinned, but sent them, cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved under judgment. And it goes on and says, just like he didn't spare the old world, but simply Noah, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into an example uh, destroys them by fire, delivered Lot. So these are all examples of righteous people living in corruption. So, but I want to go back to this word here. If God did not spare the angels that sinned, casting them into hell. Now this word here, it's not mistranslated, but if you were to die uh, and not be saved, you're ultimately going to go, you're going to go to Hades. Hades is, we remember Jesus talking about the two different compartments. There's where like the Abraham's bosom was and where the sinners were, but it's called Hades still. So Hades is the realm of the, the dead for human beings. This particular word is Tartarus. And so there's Tartarus, there's the lake of fire, there's Hades, there's the two compartments. It's kind of a, a whole bunch of words that specifically, that means very specific things, but the word hell kind of encompasses them all. And so let's look at this. If we run over to uh, the King James Plus, we can see here that delivered them, okay, down to hell. It's the Greek word 5020. And when we look at that, you should be able to say it. It's the word Tartaros. And notice in the King James, it only occurs once. So all the other times when it says hell, it's referring to Hades, the lake of fire, something else. This is a very specific place. So Satan and the fallen angels are not chained in Tartarus. There's another group that is, Peter is referring us to. So I wanted to share that with you. So in here then, we see that Jude quotes chapter 1, a little piece of chapter 1, about prophecy right before the second coming. They understood two comings. And the both refer to these angels that send. Peter says they're in Tartarus. Jude said they metamorphosized. So we're going to look at that particular thing. So now if we go on back to here, um, this is uh, chapter 6 through 16. And this is a book we put out about Enoch, the ancient book of Enoch. Uh, so we're going to just look at chapters 6, 7, and 8 to get the basic story. Now, when we look at <clears throat> other uh, church fathers and other documents, uh, matter of fact, you can kind of pull together. This is the bulk of what happened, but there's a lot of other details that are given in Enoch, in the book of Jubilees, um, 
among quotes from different church fathers, you just have to go through the church fathers, but they will pull this out and mention it every so often, almost all of them, somewhere along the line, if they wrote a lot. Um, let's see, Enoch Jubilees, church fathers, and then there's a few other documents, some Dead Sea Scrolls and other things that talk about this. But pulling it all together, this happened in the days of Jared. So if you go to our DSS calendar website and you're studying the calendar, uh, the, the Essenes or the, the Zadok priests, the ones that kept the Dead Sea Scrolls, they're the ones that uh, have a, a, a fairly complete calendar with all the details in it. You know, like we start at creation, Adam, when he was 130, had Seth, and you can go on down, and the flood occurs in the year 1656. Well, the, the sixth person from Adam is Jared, and it was in the days of Jared, it says, that these angels fell, so before Enoch was born. So, um, and the way this works, when you're talking about generations and time periods like that, it's not a set of years. So Jared was born. Once he's born, that starts the days of Jared. And they don't end when he dies, but when he has a firstborn son, kind of like a, a, a dynasty of a king, when he became king and when he uh, abdicates or maybe he dies, but that kind of a thing. So we're going on like that. So it's around the year 600 from creation that this event occurs. So it says, it came to pass in those days <clears throat> that the children of men multiplied and beautiful and fair daughters were born to them. Now, this is almost identical to Genesis chapter 6. Um, now, I, I should make mention, people say, well, why, why isn't this in the Bible? Moses is trying to give a synopsis of everything. So in the first six chapters of Genesis, you have a real brief synopsis of everything that happened in those 1600 years. So if you think about it, it talks about Adam, you know, and, and Eve conceived and they had Cain and Abel. That's an important story. And then Cain goes off and then there's Seth and the Sethites. And then there's this story about Lamech accidentally killing somebody who's not named. And then there's the thing about the guys in chapter six, you know, the guys. And then he goes on. So these are major events. The whole story of who Lamech killed and what happened and why that was a major deal. There's a big history about it. Moses is simply saying, you know, when Lamech killed the guy and the, the event happened, it was there. It was right after that that this happened. Right after that that these things happened. And then he mentions in chapter six, you know, about the angels and all that stuff. And then after that, this happens and we we'll finally get to the flood. So he's giving a very brief synopsis of all of this history. So it came to pass in those days that the children of men multiplied and beautiful and fair daughters were born to them. The angels, the sons of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, come let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget children. So again, how would that even be possible for an angel? They metamorphosized. How do they do that? We don't know. But the story is they did that somehow. So this is it. Now it says their leader out of the angels that wanted to do this. There's a small group. The leader of that group was a, an angel named Shemyaza. Okay. Semyaza, Shemyaza. <laughs> it's in a different, it, the, the, the name is different in a few different places, but basically this is the guy, Shemyaza is the name usually given. Uh, he said to them, I am afraid that you will not truly agree to this deed. And I alone will have to pay the penalty for this great sin. So they understood that you don't mix species. And when you go back to, say, like the book of Jasher, it doesn't mention anything specific about angels, but it talks about the leaders began to mix species. Of course, the only way they would understand that is by this event here. So there's some interesting Dead Sea Scrolls we're going to look at that tells us the technology and how they mixed species, among other things. But we'll get into that in the coming weeks. So he's afraid. He understands this is a sin. 
this is actually a pretty serious sin. And he doesn't want to be the only guy blamed for it. Uh, so he said, that's, that's what he says. Now, they answered to him, the rest of those angels in that group, we all swear to bind ourselves by mutual oath not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. They want to create or recreate earth in their image, so to speak. So they all together bound themselves by an oath. There were 200 total. So 200 show Shemiaz is the leader, just like Lucifer is the leader of a who knows how many angels that fell probably before Adam and Eve were created. Uh, and at this point in the days of Jared, there is a leader, Shemiaz, and a 200 group that descended. Now, between the two, it doesn't tell us here because this is where the major problem develops. Prior to this, there was an angel named Azazel, and he's referenced in uh, Leviticus and a few other places. In the King James Bible, he's called the scapegoat. The scapegoat ritual is actually a ritual that refers to Azazel. It's the Azazel goat, but it's, it's so old, most people have forgotten what it actually means. So there's actually three rebellions here, or falls. There's Lucifer, there's Azazel, and Shemyaza. So Lucifer takes a third of the angels, uh, Azazel comes by himself. He just wants to do stuff. They see what's going on with Lucifer and they see what's going on with Azazel. And so far, no punishments doesn't look like. So they decide they want to do this too, but they tend to, and what happens is they mess things up royally. We're going to see that in a minute. But so Shemyaz is, is the leader of this group. There's 200 angels. To think of 200 beings that do something that totally messes up the planet bad enough that the planet has to be wiped out is interesting. We also know like when Nimrod came up to, to attack the Japhethites, he came up with a force of 500 men, just 500 men. And with his 500 men, he was able to take over and create an empire. That was the first post-flood empire. So it doesn't take millions and millions and millions of people or beings to get a job done if you're very serious about it. In this case, 200. 200 angels in total descended in the days of Jared. Okay, it is in here. Upon Artus, the summit of Mount Hermon. So, and this is interesting too. There's other documents that talk about up on Mount Hermon. There used to be, and I think it's been used to, to a museum, in the days of Cyrus when he took over everything. He ascended up there, looked around, had a monument created, which basically says those that descended in those days descended here. So really interesting that everybody knew this ancient history. So they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves an oath upon it. So in some dialect, Hermon means oath or swearing, something like that. Not necessarily in modern Hebrew, but this is the reason they called it, you know, the mountain of the oath. So, and this is the Mount Hermon that borders Israel and Syria. So this is the one everybody's fighting over. And I think it's interesting because if you were to go to Mount Hermon, if it would be allowed and start doing excavation, you would first notice that there is a crusader castle there. Um, and that would be like a thousand AD or something. If you dig further down, everybody says, who knows what would be there? Well, tradition has a castle that Nimrod had actually created back when he created the empire. Everybody gravitates back to Mount Hermon for a specific reason. And way before that, in the pre-flood world, this was the center of the angelic rebellion. So anyway, so that's why they called it Mount Hermon. These are the names of their leaders, okay? Semyaza is their leader in general, and under him, they're like subgroups. There's Akrabel, Ramiel, and I may be pronouncing these wrong, but anyway, um, Ak Akabiel, Tamiel, Ramiel, Daniel, not Daniel, but Dan Danel, uh, Ezekiel, Barakrel, Azael, 
which is different than Azazel. Aramos, Bat, Batahal, um, Aniel, uh, Zevabi, Samasifpil, Satriel, Turiel, Yom Yael, Sariel. And so the, that's the, the main leaders of this group. Now, again, these look Hebrew, but, it, but uh, uh, we got to remember that this has been translated from Hebrew into the Giez language, which is Ethiopia. And that's where we have this whole book. Major portions or major chapters, whole chapters in some cases, have been found in the Dead Sea Scrolls that are identical, with the stories are identical. Uh, the names, though, sometimes can be different. So if you pick up a different book of Enoch, it may have different names. And it's not really important. The main people are Lucifer, uh, Azazel, and Shemyaza, and then those under him. Now, there's a few people in here we're going to learn are kind of interesting, so we learn their names. But so that's the these are the letters of the rest of the 200, Okay. <clears throat> so they descended to do this deed. So then chapter 7 gives us a little more to the story. Each of the 200 chose a wife for himself and began to go into them, mate with them, and taught them different things. So basically what you're doing, just like you or I would go to a foreign country that might be poverty uh, don't have much, we get married, we decide to settle there. As Americans, we're going to say, well, why don't we set up some solar panels? They have no idea what a solar panel is. Well, I'll, you know, order one from Amazon, have it shipped in, whatever. So you're going to end up changing things. The white guy that's there, all of a sudden he makes things move because of the sunlight and he does all these different things. And if you start teaching them how to do these things through technology, they will learn that too. Now, if I'm evil, if I'm good, I'm just going to say, this is just technology. I'll show you how to do it, have fun with it, have a good life. And that would be it. I'm a brother. If I'm an evil guy, I'm going to say, I'm going to teach you how to gain your spiritual powers. But understand, I am a God. So don't mess with me or I'll take your powers away. I will teach you how to do this stuff. And I want money or whatever, you know, this kind of a thing. You enslave the people, and that changes the entire society. And that's really what's going on here, uh, because we'll see this in a minute. So uh, each of the 200 took a wife, okay, and, and mated with them. And they taught them sorcery, enchantments, the cutting of roots, and made them acquainted with plants. Now, I want to draw your attention to this. Sorcery is the way it's usually translated here. It's pharmakia. It's the use of drugs. Now, the use of drugs, if we're talking about drugs in general, uh, if I have a problem, certain drugs will cure my ailment. If I don't have that problem, they will probably cause a problem. So you got to be real careful with it. Some poisons would kill me, but if I've already been poisoned by something, that poison might be the antidote. So this is what we're talking about here. So it's not wrong necessarily to teach them the sorcery or the, the drugs, the herbs, that kind of stuff. And then the enchantment is using these things to control um, animals. If you're aware, for instance, that you, if you want to attract cats to your backyard, plant some catnip. Why? It doesn't do anything to anybody else. Ah, oh, but it does to, to cats. So if that's what you want, you can attract animals. Say you, say you hunted and ate cats, then that you'd want lots of catnips in your yard, you know, that kind of thing. Whatever it is you're wanting to do. There's certain things that would repel certain animals and others that are not. So if you had to go hunting animals that were hard to find, this would be wonderful. Set out some stuff in a trap, just go pick up your food. Uh, the cutting of roots, again, how to how to harvest them, that kind of thing, and make medicine, made them acquired with this plants. So this in general is not necessarily evil. It can be used for evil. 
but I just hold out that thought and we'll come back to it. Now it goes on and says, these women became pregnant and gave birth to great giants. So the word here for giant is Nephilim. And the word, if you break it up in Hebrew, the word Nephal means to fall. And it's used like in grammar, for instance, a Nephal verb is a past tense verb. It's fallen. It's in the past as opposed to present or future or whatever. So a Nephal verb is like the most common verb in the Hebrew language. So when you say Nephal and then you add im to it, it's like us in English putting an S on something, making it plural. Well, im is plural masculine. So if this Nephal, if it's a group of people, probably guys, we, we would call it Nephal im. So the question is, what are these fallen ones? Because people can fall lots of different ways. Uh, it may, gives you the connotation that they were evil or something. Well, if they're angels, they would have fallen from heaven. But these are the kids of the angels. So they didn't fall from heaven. But a, in another word, there, there's a sister language to Hebrew called Aramaic. And in Aramaic, the word nephalia means giant. Just like we would think of a very tall, big guy. It's a giant. Uh, and so that begins to be the common word used, just like we saw hell meant either Tartarus or Hades or Gehenna or all sorts of stuff. The word giant or Nephilim refers to different things. And as we go through the Old Testament, we'll see that there are Nephilim, there are Raphaim, there are uh, Zamzamin, there are Anakim, uh, lots of different groups. Uh, and these are all different subgroups of giants. Um, okay, so it says the woman became pregnant, gave birth to great giants. This says whose height reached up 3,000 L's. L is probably either a span or a cubit. Um, that's obviously got to be a typo of some sort. Remember, when it comes to numbers, most of these things are off somehow. Uh, even the Septuagint, just different thing. The numbers seem to always be different. So not sure how tall they actually were. In Amos, uh, it actually says that the Nephilim, their height were almost to the top of the cedars. So however tall a cedar was. So that might be 30 uh, cubits or 30, 30 feet rather. Um, and again, maybe they didn't get that tall. Uh, lots of debate on this. But the point is that they were giants. They were very tall, very powerful. And there's all these legends from among the um, Native Americans and other pla other people in different places of the planet all saying the same thing. So great giants, Nephalia. These giants consumed all the food. Well, it would be. Uh, one of the guys did a study they were thinking about that Amos passage about a giant being 30 feet. So they're thinking, what would a bare minimum be for you to eat? Like you're a, say a six foot man, how much food would you have to eat a day just to survive? And they said like maybe a three quarters of a hamburger or one hamburger or something like that. And they said, well, if you were a giant 30 feet, how much food in hamburgers, for instance, would you have to eat to just survive? Not to grow muscle, but just survive. And it was something like 100 hamburgers or something. Um, so you got to think about these. It's like my dinner would be nothing to an elephant. So you can understand that if they really were giants in that literal sense, very tall, very big, they would consume all the food. When men could no longer sustain them, the giants turned and devoured mankind. Some people call this cannibalism, but it's actually different species. So I don't know if you could call it that, but they would eat people. Same, same kind of legends among the Native Americans and other people of what they would do. They also began to sin against birds, beasts, reptiles, fish, and to devour one another's flesh and drink blood. Then the earth laid accusation against the lawless ones. So in this case, we're not sure if this means when they began to sin against them would be like to eat all of them, meaning if you eat, they, they'd go extinct. So maybe that's what it means. 
or the sin could be genetic manipulation, which we understand we'll see later occurs. Uh, the earth laid accusation against them. Now let's look at uh, chapter eight. Now as a zeal, he's not been mentioned up until this point, and he's actually different from these 200. But same kind of stuff. He came earlier to do basically the same thing. But according to the text, he hung out somewhere in a place away from people. I mean, he had his wife or wives or whatever and did his cattle and whatever he did. According to the old text, his children or his group were called Sedim. And so it's a very specific type of Nephilim. Uh, what they looked like, what they did, I'm not sure. But it was interesting that they everybody knew that that was his creation. That was different from these guys. But Azazel taught men to make swords, knives, shields, and armor from the metals of the earth. Now, again, let me ask you a question. Just like we talked about the sorcery, the pharmacia, the herbs, the, the cutting of roots. Is it wrong to have a pocket knife or a short sword or something for defense or a shield? Maybe you don't want a weapon per se, like you don't want to carry a gun or whatever, but at least lock your doors. And, you know, how are you going to feel safe? Well, I've got a steel plate, you know, one of those steel plated front doors with extra dead bolts. Nobody's getting through that thing. Well, that's kind of like a shield. There's nothing wrong with protecting yourself. Okay. And metals of the earth would probably be a better way of doing it rather than wood or whatever. So it's not that per se. But again, this whole concept of I'm going to give you secrets. I'm going to make you a god and but you've got to give me something back and you do this in a wrong way you get rich but you de totally destroy the the uh the customs and the, the lifestyle of those people so he says it goes on and says he also taught women how to see behind them in other words he invented the mirror for a specific reason and we all have mirrors. I look in the mirror every day, every day. Nothing wrong with that. But how to see behind them, how to make bracelets and ornaments and other kinds of jewelry using precious stones. He also taught the beautifying of the eyes with makeup of various colors. Okay. So when you give guys weapons and you get the girls to look really pretty to, to be able to see behind them and do the makeup and the eyes and all this stuff, what happens? Everybody goes crazy. It says this led them astray into first off fornication. Okay. I can see that pretty easy and godliness. And they became corrupt in all their ways. Uh, what happens when you've got just a handful of women and a handful of guys and one woman begins to beautify, beautify herself in some way that you don't know how to do and she picks the guys or kind of pulls husbands away she might get killed i mean this is like this is your way of life that somebody is destroying okay now shemyaza taught enchantments and root cuttings amaros taught how to resolve enchantments okay and the opposite uh bakriel taught astrology now, it does say astrology, not astronomy. So astronomy is just one of those things. So astrology is this concept of how to uh, tell your future, that kind of stuff. Ancient astronomy, according to the Talmud and other things, was a little bit different yet. The ancient astrology didn't even have a horoscope. It wasn't so much set on me figuring out by random powers what's going to happen tomorrow. But the idea was you mark the death date of your ancestors and you have a special, I won't get into the gory details, but you have a special idol or object that is from your ancestor. And at the right date, you do the right ritual if you have the right object. And according to the idea is that you can contact them. So I could contact my dad, for instance, who probably knows everything now because he's been gone and ask him a question. 
that is a uh, necromacy type thing, but it was connected to astrology in that sense. Because I couldn't just ask him any day of the year. It had to be on his death date. I had to do it with the right ritual. Now, I don't believe in any of this, but I'm just saying this is a false religious system that they put together. Now, if they would could control demons, for instance, or could themselves masquerade as dad, um, you, this is a type of manipulation. Just like if I was to uh, be the guy behind the curtain, you know, or have wires and I manipulated stuff and made you think something's going on in my church. I'm just trying to manipulate Leo. If I get you to believe it, then I get your money and all your other stuff. But if you actually believe this stuff, uh, think about it. You go to a Baptist church and they don't have things flying around. You go to my church and things are happening. So you abandon your faith and come and be part of this faith. So this is the kind of thing they're doing. So some of these things are wrong and other things are not wrong, but they're all used together collectively by these supernatural beings, these godly, you know, people, whatever. Um, and they're going to teach you the true way. So this, they're forming their own cult. Now, Cabriel taught the signs of the constellations. Again, if you're talking about the months of the year, they already knew the calendar. So it's not just a calendar system, but it's some other kind of, um, of thing. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the moon cycles around in, in 29 and a half days. So basically every month you go through a, a moon phase, uh, waxing, full, waning, and then new. Um, the sun goes all the way around the zodiac in one year. Um, the planet Saturn, if I remember right, has a 38 or 39 year cycle. So they're probably teaching these kind of things. And again, it's just a fact. It's the way God created it. But they're using it to tell you the secrets. And again, you have to be one of us to learn the secrets, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Tom Riel taught the knowledge of the clouds, which I assume is a type of astrology, but I'm not sure what cloud reading is. I mean, I know what we think of it today, but a lot of these things are just slightly different way back when. And this other guy taught courses the moon. Uh, as mankind began to perish, they cried out to heaven. So basically you have a, a system, uh, a culture that's basically godly. Somebody walks in and says, I'm going to show you all these cool things, herbs, makeup. Uh, you can you can poison somebody if you want. You can fix poisons if you want. You can steal the guy. You can take the woman by force. Here's knives and shields. And they teach you all of these things and it destroys the society. And this is actually what happened. So next week we will go back. Well, when we come back to here, we'll go start with chapter nine and go forward. Next week, we'll probably take a break from Enoch, kind of redo this again. And we're going to look at another Dead Sea Scroll that gives us a little more information on this. And then we'll come right back to chapter nine. It's all basically Enoch type literature since we're in the area of um, uh, these uh, ancient histories. So we'll stop there for tonight. And I'm going to go over to... Um, the chat room and see if there's any chats or any questions. It's like we got 21. Ooh, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, question. Do you think it's a salvation if issue if a certain denomination believes that Jesus Christ is the angel Michael? Uh, it definitely could be. Uh, Jesus said that if you don't believe that I am, you die in your sins. Uh, and so we have the teaching in Christianity that Jesus is God incarnate. And so somebody comes along and says, no, he's an angel. No, he's just a man, for instance, uh, that'd be Unitarian, or he's actually something else. Uh, it's the same kind of stuff they had back in the first century. The Essenes believed him to be God incarnate. The Pharisees believed him to be just a, a general, just a guy, okay? And Sadducees didn't believe in angels or anything else. They didn't even believe he existed. 
And so Jesus said, if you do not be, not just believe in me, the fact that there's a Messiah, but you have to believe that I am, or you die in your sins. So it does seem like a salvation issue. And I would definitely not hang out with anybody that says that he's Michael the Archangel. Uh, you mentioned Christians who were not really Christians last week. Have you spoken about Messianic Jews in earlier videos? Are they really Christians? Yeah, Messianic Jews, well, everybody uses that different. Like I can say I'm a Christian and be a part of a cult, like the one we just talked about, or I might actually be a Christian, but either way, I'm going to call myself Christian. So the same kind of stuff with Messianics. By definition, a Messianic Jew is a Jew that continues the Jewish traditions that they live by, much like a Chinese person would be. They would eat Chinese, speak Chinese, have Chinese traditions, Chinese dress, but be Christian. So everyone's kind of like that. In this case, the, the Messianic Jews live the Jewish lifestyle, uh, which is fine, but they accept Jesus as their savior, as the Messiah, and they follow the New Testament. So they're Christian in practice. They uh, believe he's, he's the Messiah, he's God incarnate, they believe in the Trinity, etc. And there is a there's a couple of different groups, like denominations, like Messianics of America, thing like that. But now, on the other hand, there are people that are, we would call Hebrew roots. And some of them would say, no, Jesus is not the Messiah. He's the Archangel Michael, or he's just a, you know, a thing or whatever. There's no Holy Spirit. There is no Trinity. There is no rapture. Some of them would start sacrificing animals again. And, and this kind of stuff. They just don't understand the law and they misread it. And they think they're supposed to go do this stuff. And they go off in left field. And so that would be a cult. But see, the problem is some of the Hebrew roots people will say, I'm a Messianic Jew. And I've known some Messianic Jews to say, oh, I love my Hebrew roots. And they mean that literally. I like going back and studying Hebrew and studying the, the traditions and stuff. Nothing wrong with that. So by definition, Messianic Jews are Christian. They believe in Messiah. They're saved. Hebrew roots are not. But you're going to have people that claim to be one or the other. So you actually have to talk to them and find out, are you sacrificing animals in the backyard? You know, this kind of a thing. And that sounds stupid, like I'm making, making fun of them. I know a few that do that, that actually have sacrificed a goat in their backyard. Won't name names. Um, and I told them, it's like, this is sin. This is not, well, I'm doing it the old way. There is no old way. <laughs> it's, it's forbidden. But they're just messing things up like that. Um, so, yes, Messianic Jews are Christian. Okay. There's a really nice Messianic synagogue uh, not too far from here. And I'm friends with the, the uh, started to say pastor, but the, the rabbi. Uh, really great guy. There's another one a little bit further away, not the greatest guy, you know, but anyway, Christian, though. I mean, just everybody's got different um, personalities, but there's some other groups that I would not want to go over there. Another question is, I've seen many of your older videos over the last week, and I've noticed that you use Baptist denomination very often when referencing an apostate church. May I ask why or should I worry? I'm probably doing it in contrast because almost everybody thinks of a Baptist as just, you know, an average church, not, not weird, not, you know, maybe they could be better, but they're definitely not bad. And so I would contrast a Baptist with someone else that way. I'm a Calvary Chapel guy and a lot of, some people don't know what a Calvary Chapel is, but almost everybody knows what a Baptist is. So kind of the same thing in that sense. Uh, Calvary chapels are basically Baptist, kind of, uh, but we believe the gifts do continue. We believe in the premillennial reign of Christ and the pre-tribulational rapture. A lot of Baptists do also, but they don't have it in their denominational, um, like we have distinctives, you know, or the Baptist uh, name and practice, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm not slamming them. And if I sounded like that, I apologize, but uh, nothing wrong with Baptists. Well, I mean, you could have a cult that calls itself Baptist. That's always our problem. That's why you always got to ask. You could have a cult calling itself a Calvary Chapel, too. 
Hopefully, last question. Sorry, thank you. Not a problem. Where can I find the Noahide laws in the Bible? I can't see them referenced anywhere. They're basically mentioned in um, Genesis chapter 9, I believe. The whole idea is that in, in I think it's chapter 9, chapter 8 or 9, pretty sure it's 9. Uh, Noah says that he calls his sons and they are to go out and form, de not denominations, nations. And they are to do certain things. They don't allow murder. If someone kills, uh, you know, if they shed man's blood by man, their blood shall be shed. Um, and they don't, you know, they do different things like that. They're supposed to form um, governments and court systems and run things accordingly. So like three or four of the Noahide laws are mentioned there in that chapter. Um, the main contrast, though, is if you look at it in chapter nine, for instance, it mentions that you can eat meat. Okay, and some people think that maybe we didn't eat meat pre-flood. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. But either way, at this point, you're perfectly fine in eating meat. Okay, anything, anything that crawls, just make sure uh, there's no blood in it. In other words, anything you decide to eat, make sure to kill it and cook it well done so you don't get a disease. So if you like cows or pigs or, or whatever, cook it well done. Now, in chapter, or when you get up to Leviticus, the Jews are told to only eat kosher, kosher rather. So there's certain things you can eat, certain things you can't. If you go a little bit further on in Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy 14.21, for instance, it mentions that something that's not kosher, for instance, the example is something that dies of itself. A Jew would only have kosher food, but if it's not slaughtered properly, it becomes unkosher and you can't eat it. So what do you do? Waste the meat? No, you give it to the Gentiles that live in the city with you and they can eat it because they're not under the same covenant as you. So that's like a contrast, for instance. So in chapter nine, uh, you can eat meat, just don't eat blood. Um, Leviticus is uh, for Jews and Deuteronomy shows that Jews and Gentiles can live together um, with not a, without a problem. I don't mean married, but I mean in the same city. And the Gentiles always eat anything basically as long as they cook it well done you're not supposed to drink blood but the jews have the kosher food so the um the whole concept of the seven noahide laws are given in Maimonides. we've got it written in our book uh, ancient law of kings and we reference it at a few other places i think it's interesting nobody really has said this anciently but there's seven colors in the rainbow and chapter nine is where you've got the basic noahide laws and the rainbow covenant and so it's interesting to me that there's seven Noahide laws and there are seven colors of the rainbow. I'm assuming then each color represents one of the laws. And I think it's really interesting that the homosexual movement, because homosexuality is a type of fornication according to these laws, but the homosexual movement decided to make, or the gay pride or whatever you want to call it, a rainbow as their symbol, but they removed one of the colors. It's a six colored rainbow. I don't know if anybody did it on purpose or not, but I just think it's really interesting. It's like, well, we're getting we're rid of this one era. So we're going to have a six color rainbow instead of a seven colored rainbow. Just really interesting to me. So anyway, uh, hopefully that that helps. Um, if the numbers are skewed from another language translations like the Septuagint, could the numbers have been skewed? in the Ethiopic translation of Enoch. Yes, actually, they, there's a couple places where they are. The only way we know for sure is when you compare it to um, the chapters that we have uh, and the numbers are different or, you know, some other thing. One, one, one book might say it was a bear and the other one says it was a lion. There's a place like that in Enoch also, uh, but it's basically the same concept. So, yeah, in the Book of Jubilees, for instance, it's really obvious because it starts starts off at creation and it starts getting off uh, decade by decade. And you're almost thinking like, well, number one, the way that the Ethiopic version of Jubilees is written, it makes you think of Jubilees 49 years instead of 50. So that's one of the problems. And the years keep getting off and off and off. Well, it should be consistent if all of my centuries are are 98 years, it, I should slowly just keep getting further and further off. 
But Jubilees will get to a point where it's actually about 300 years off from Genesis. Then you can tell somebody begins to correct it and it begins to go back. So when you get to the time of the death, I think it's the death of Jacob or one of those guys, it's only one year different from Genesis. So you can tell that it got off and then somebody tried to correct it. I don't know why numbers, for whatever reason, are just really hard to translate from one language to another. It's just a consistent thing. You always want to check the numbers. So yeah, so Enoch, the numbers are off. Jubilee's numbers are off. Josephus even has different numbers than Genesis. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls are identical to Genesis. So the Dead Sea Scrolls seem to be perfect. Of course, they're Hebrew. It's no trans. It's no translation involved. Um, so yeah, there. It's, it's interesting in that way. We just have to be careful and know that just just about everything that we do is a translation. I thought angels did not lust. This must be connected to their fall, right? Yeah, uh, normal angels don't do that, but this is something that they decided to. And it says lust in there because <clears throat> that's definitely part of it. But I've always wondered if it wasn't more of a, I would like to create not even a family, but an empire. You know, I create my own people. A lot of us write science fiction, you know, or like Star Trek and finding other cultures. What if you could change everything? What would you change? You know, make skin purple, pointed ears. What would you change, you know? And they could begin to do that kind of thing, possibly. Um, but lust apparently is connected with it anyway. Yeah, but so that's the fall. Uh, studying Matthew 24 with a Church of Christ group, they teach that all of this happened in 70 AD. Yeah. Uh, Revelation is all symbolic of things that have already happened. Uh, do you know anything about their doctrines? Yeah, there's several different churches of Christ and Christian churches and different ones like that. There's actually one cult that has got the name Church of Christ in it. It used to be called Boston Church of Christ. And then it became Churches of Christ International. Now, I think now it's something else. Um, not the Churches of Christ or a cult. Like I said, there's a weird Baptist. There's a weird one of everything, it seems like, in name. But uh, yeah, they, they're basically teaching a, a type of what's called preterism. And the problem is that some of the prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD and others are not. And some of them are uh, reoccurring. They happen every so often. So for instance, prophecies about the Jews being hated and uh, uh, attacked, that constantly has went on for hundreds of years, thousands of years actually. And still goes on, like the Hamas war with Israel. No matter who's right or who's wrong, it's yet another attack on Jews for whatever reason. Uh, so, yeah, I would probably not study with them because I think that would lead you down a wrong path. Uh, you're going to miss a lot of things. And it's really hard. you got to really squint at certain things to, to get all of it happening back then. Um, so, for instance, just looking at Daniel 9, you, you can see, you can get up to Antiochus Epiphanes, and they say that that's where it ends, for instance. But it very clearly says that um, the, 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 the um, Jews then at that point were uh, in trouble. Uh, there was Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greeks from the north. And then it says that the ships of Kittim came. So you get to the Roman Empire. Rome takes over the whole area, and then it talks about them destroying the temple. That's 70 AD. And then the temple is destroyed, the Jews are scattered, then they come back, and then the things start up again. So obviously in Daniel, we've went through the Roman Empire, through the expulsion, and back to 1948. So it can't all be way back when. And there's lots of other examples of that kind of stuff. For instance, in Daniel, they probably they obviously reject this, but in Daniel, there's three places where you've got timeline prophecies. And the most most that, that uh, um, the most well known is from Daniel chapter nine, which is gives you a date, a certain event that happens so many days forward, and that's when the Messiah is cut off. and it is actually to the day. 
And so we get to 32 AD as the death of the Messiah. The same thing the scrolls say from another prophecy. But it also talks about the second return of Israel, which is 1948. And it occurred on May 14th, 1948, which is prophesied to the day. And then they were supposed to take the Temple Mount back in June 7th of 1967, which was to the day. And that, that event also happened. And so you've got at least three timeline prophecies. So it can't all have been fulfilled way back when. So after 1948 and after 1967, certain things happen, like the Hamas war, the taking of southern Lebanon, uh, the Psalm 83 war, the uh, Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah uh, 49. Matter of fact, Enoch, we'll get to it quite a bit later, but Enoch talks about an upcoming war with Israel and says Persia in the text, but we're talking about Iran, or Iran's ancient name was Persia. And it's interesting, it talks about it has something to do with these fallen angels. And it's not Armageddon, it's not, not at the end, it's not at the time when the kingdom is established or anything like that, it's before that. So it's really interesting. If you think the rapture is fairly close, uh, then the war with Israel and Iran ought to be really close. Not saying it has to be before or after, but it's in that area. It's before the second coming, a good amount of time before it. So, okay, hopefully that helps. I have always believed that there was one at one time a rebellion in the angels and one third sided with Satan and two thirds who chose God. So after the other angels... So after that, other angels still chose to rebel. Yeah, according to these texts, there was Lucifer and however many he had. And I know some people say that the we get that from Revelation. It talks about the dragon, his tail drew one third of the stars. And stars are another term for angels, uh, just like sons of God or angels. Uh, and so that could be talking about this is what he did way back when or what he's doing then. So there's a, a bit of debate on that. But yeah, there was the fall of Lucifer with the angels that followed him. Uh, and then there's Azazel, which was kind of by himself, I guess. And then sometime thereafter was Semyaza in the 200. And we'll see kind of what happens after that. So yeah, according to these texts, that's what it happened. What is John referring to when he says it is the last hour in 1 John 2.18? Um, I believe it, it all depends on when exactly that was written. If we plug it into, I mean, talking about time, if you plug it into the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, uh, 75 AD is the end of the age. And the prophecy is before the end of the age, the temple would be destroyed. Israel would be, you know, all these things would happen. And then somewhere along those lines, Israel would be scattered. And so depending on what he means, like the literal end of the age, if he's writing this before 70, uh, like in the 60s or something, he's talking about times very short. In the near future, the temple is going to be destroyed. I suggest you quit your job and you move out of Jerusalem. If you're a temple priest, this is the same kind of teaching that Paul gives in Hebrews. He's talking to the Hebrew priests saying, look, I understand that you can pick Sadducee, Pharisee or Essene. That's cool. If whatever's logical to you. But then when the Messiah comes, you saw him come. You saw him heal the blind, raise the dead. You know, it's him. Right. And so you look at his teaching and what he does. Does it match with the Pharisees, the Sadducees, or the Essenes, or some other group? Well, it matches with that one, and I'm over here. Then convert. Well, but I would lose my position in the church. Think about what you're saying. You don't know for sure, and you pick one. That's understandable. Messiah's here. You saw him with your own two eyes, and you're going to reject the Messiah? That's inexcusable convert you know before it's too late because you understand that you know this group has one set of prophecies this group has another you've seen the messiah come and this group is correct so far the other part of the prophecies is that the temple is going to be destroyed i suggest you stop going to the temple 
just real simple. And this is kind of the same thing. I think that's what John is getting to, too, that the hour is short, maybe like that 70 AD one. Or even after that, I mean, they kept trying to do the like all the way up to the Bar Kokhba rebellion in 135. Uh, and it was disastrous. Those people that didn't accept the Messiah that tried to stay in Judaism and then fight the Jews, it was or fight the Romans rather. It was horrible, horrible, according to the histor historical text. So I think that's probably what we're talking about. Now, we can take a reference from that and know that we need to be very careful because we're going to have problems like that. Uh, and we do in the churches, you know, different things. But we're going to have really bad problems right before the end of the age. Incidentally, the end of the age of our age, according to the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, is 2075. Not that that's necessarily when the second coming is going to be or anything, but just the calendar we're talking about. So the last jubilee, which is sometimes called the last generation, would be from 2025 to 2075. So the way they teach, I would expect most of the end time prophecies to occur between 2025 and 2075, which would include the, you know, the Antichrist, the tribulation, the rapture, the second coming, all that's in there. But all this other stuff, too. I mean, Psalm 83 and um, the war with Iran and all that stuff. And it looks like it's gearing up. Uh, so we only have a year and a half or a year and a quarter, actually, before that time period begins. Um, so it's really interesting to kind of look at those things and see, not that anything couldn't happen right now. The rapture could happen right now. Psalm 83 could happen right now. Any of those could, but the bulk of them, according to the way the Essenes teach, is going to be in that last 50 year period. But that's only a year and a half away. And we can see things being set up for that now. They actually have a lot to say about prophecy. So it's really interesting. Not they would necessarily be 100% accurate, although that's what Josephus says. But again, even if they're accurate, we got to be very careful how we read it. You stated that Lucifer fell before Adam and Eve were created. How do you know that? Also, is the snake that spoke to Eve Lucifer? That's what most of us believe. Um, uh, there is some being that came into the Garden of Eden uh, in the form of a snake or possessed a snake or looked like a snake or whatever, a serpent rather, uh, could be a seraph. Seraphs look like serpents. So it could have been just a seraph came in, coming into the garden. But the whole point is if there is a person or a, an angel of some sort trying to tempt Adam and Eve, they're evil. They've already fallen. And if the first fall was through Lucifer, then that would have already happened. So the fall of Lucifer and whoever was with him probably some cherubs, some seraphs, and some other types of groups. So it, it may have been Satan in the Garden of Eden uh, or something else, because Ezekiel gives us uh, the detail. I think it's Ezekiel 14 or 28. Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, I believe it is. Um, but it talks about <clears throat> the Lucifer, the son of the morning, Hallel, is uh, an anointed cherub that covered the throne, and he was a musician. So you've got this cherub. Now, the snake, as it's translated, is a seraph. A seraph is different than a cherub. It's a different species. So it may not necessarily have been Satan directly, but somebody with his group, at least. In either case, no matter how you do this, there's been a fall. So that's how we know that Satan fell uh, before, either before creation or at least before Adam and Eve fell, something like that. And then it was some time after that that we had Azazel. And then during the days of Jared, uh, 600 years later, is when the 200 descended, according to this text. Uh, can you speak to what Mount Hermon may be a part of, both the millennium and the judgment of the tribulation that comes before it? Oh, about it being flattened. Okay. Well, first off, there's a prophecy about the, the mountains being flattened in, in Revelation. And that might mean, it, it says all of them. It could be all of them in an area or something like that. But it might be talking about literal mountains. But it could also be talking about the empires. Because in all the ancient prophecies, going all the way back to like the Testament of Noah and the Dead Sea Scrolls, 
those ancient empires are looked at as being mountains and they will all be destroyed or flattened by the time the Messiah comes, which is part of the prophecy. Uh, it's a mountain of gold and silver and brass and iron and other things that matches Daniel's statue perfectly. Um, but as far as Mount Hermon, um, I don't know that it's really anything anymore. It just happened to be the place where they descended. And if you're looking for writings from them to learn to do stuff that they do, that would be a first place you would go to to look to see if there's any monuments or whatever. It's what happened with Canaan and other stuff way back when, which is another part of the history we'll get to eventually. Do you see that the rapture is acting as a cog in the wheel to stop some of the same developing of technology too quickly? I definitely think it's part of the pro part of the process. There's a place in Enoch that seems to indicate that the rapture is for the purpose of engendering repentance. And that makes sense if you think about it, if we're getting close to the end and nobody believes those wacky Christians, and then all of a sudden they all disappear. And then you realize there's some Christians that are still here. And then you talk to them and you realize they're not that serious or they're a cult or whatever. But all those hardcore guys that loved you, that wanted you to get saved, that you know did stuff for you, when you look at that, they're all gone. So you begin to realize that there must have been a rapture, that weird, I never believed in it, but, and that causes a major uh, time of repentance. Now they're going to have to go through the tribulation. There'll be tribulation saints, maybe get killed. But so I definitely see that as, as a uh, cog in the wheel, so to speak. In 2 Thessalonians, it talks about the restrainer, which I think is the, the Christian church filled with the spirit before the rapture. I think we're what hold back the, uh, the Antichrist system because we won't take a mark. Some of us won't do other things. And when the government comes and says, you will do this, if we're a minority, that's fine. But if the vast majority are Christians or semi-Christians or of that same mindset or patriots, for instance, I will not do what I'm told. There's not much the government can do when like 80% of the people say no. It's just not going to happen. So the people, if there's enough of them, withhold evil. But when the rapture occurs, all the godliness is gone. And then the fear comes and all the other stuff, everybody kind of falls in line. I just read the Testament of our Lord compiled by Clement of Rome. Chapter 7, Jesus is describing signs before the Antichrist. Babies being born with gray hair. I saw one online. Could that be, a, could that be close to the end? There's actually several manuscripts that talk about that kind of thing. Uh, some of them talk about babies being born at four months and actually surviving and babies being grown with gray hair. Um, it, the way that those set of prophecies sound, it's like the aging process speeds up. Talks about normal people uh, going gray in their 20s. Now, there's always somebody that grayed in their 20s. There's always a premature baby, but it almost sounds like this is kind of a normal thing gestation periods um, shorten, not gestation periods, uh, puberty rather, um, the graying, the old age, the dying early, stuff like that. Um, and there's lots of debate on what that means. Is it just because something happened? Uh, if there was some sort of an uh, exchange of nuclear radiation, would that cause everybody's aging to be speeded up? I think we would just all get leukemia and die, you know, but something happens. Uh, with the food source, with the air, with radiation, with chemicals, with something, you know. And so uh, the scrolls give a hint at that kind of stuff. It has to do with Nephilim medicine, and we'll kind of see what that is next week. Um, but anyway, um, got to be real careful saying certain things in public. Anyway, so uh, yeah, very well could be. And that's an interesting testament. Uh, Eusebius mentions... Uh, that Pappas used this, believed in it. He doesn't say that it's wrong, just that Pappas got confused by it and became a pre-trip guy. 
<laughs> just kind of interesting. But then I noticed that Ignatius also quoted it. Um, and so it's really interesting to see that. And it's the quote about like the pre-trib rapture. There seems to be two separate quotes in there uh, that sound like it's quoting the Didache. Now, the, now, what's interesting, or the Didache might be quoting it, but what's interesting is Ignatius died at 95 AD. The Didache is sometime in the first half. So you've gotten Papias is after that. But in that area, if they're quoting something older that they think is legitimate, you're talking about a document that's around 50 AD. And it's still just talking about the same stuff. So it's really, really interesting. So, yeah, uh, I've seen stuff like that, too. Um, it's We're getting lots of weird diseases, uh, I guess, from chemicals, from food, from, I mean, the I don't know for sure where they're coming from, but it could be a little bit of all of this. Lack of exercise, eating the wrong foods, preservatives in the foods, depending on what country you're living on is, and, and stuff. Um, there's still places around the country, or around the world, a few places where people live to be 120. And it's just normal there. But they eat very natural food. They have very little stress, totally different lifestyle. They have herbal medicine. And the scrolls talk about that kind of a thing, too. So it's a fascinating deal. So you and I are, are in one camp. Some of these people are going to age much, much quicker. And if you follow a scene medicine, you're going to age much, much slower. So really interesting to see that. That's why I keep trying to study the herbal medicine stuff. At the time of the fall, were the angels more intelligent and knowledgeable than humans? Yeah, I would say so but they were never all knowing. No, because they're created beings. I think I skipped one here. Yeah. Uh, Jasher 418 states, judges and rulers took wives by force. Uh, in this passage, the same as what is in Enoch 7. I believe so. Uh, in Enoch, it just says rulers. So you're going to assume maybe it's tribal rulers or something. But if you continue reading chapter 4, it talks about they took the wives by force. They did things. They conquered. One of the things is they taught the mixture of species of animals. And if you look at it very, very close, it says the mixture of, and we'll get into this next week, but the, mi the mixture of animals and birds. And the way that it's worded, it's not like these two birds making a pink one. These two horses making a, you know, brown horse or something. It's talking about mixing the horse and the, and the I don't, it doesn't say horse, but the, the animal and the fowl. That's not something that you can just do by breeding practices. So there's no way that a human would just say, hey, I think if I do this, I'll make a Pegasus and have it work. It just, it's not going to happen. So if it actually happened, the rulers I mean, these might be human rulers that it's talking about, but they get their information from somewhere else. So we're going to see that in, in a Dead Sea Scroll. The Dead Sea Scroll we're going to look at that talks about that in, in depth is called the uh, the Book of Giants, Book of Nephilim. So we'll see that next time. Fascinating, isn't it? It's just there's a whole lot of stuff. That's why I always think it's interesting when you get denominations that talk about Genesis 6 as Sethites and Canaanites. It's like you're going to have to ignore all of this information. I know it sounds very science fiction-y, you know, but still, it's a whole body of literature. It's not like one little quote. Where in the scripture do we see where angels took human form? Um, there's, there's actually quite a few. Um, there is, um, let's see, uh, the parents of Samson, if I remember correctly, the angel came there. You see the angel of the Lord that might be a Christophany, or it might be an angel. Um, anyway, uh, with uh, Joshua. Uh, and then you see the, the other ones in the book of Judges. Uh, you see what looks like the Lord and two angels appearing to Abraham. I think that's chapter 14. Anyway, uh, Paul says not to... Uh, worry about entertaining uh, strangers because many people have entertained angels unaware. So we have a lot of a um, lot of places where angels appear as people and do things. As far as taking human form, like being able to reproduce or whatever, that's just Genesis chapter six. 
well, Genesis chapter 6, Jude, Second Peter, a few other things like that, but mainly, mainly that one. Um, do you think that the Native Americans are Shemites? I'm not sure. There's a guy from, um, I'm trying to think of what that was. Uh, creation, one of the creation groups, Ken Ham's group, there is a guy that's working with them that, is, that has figured out a way to do an easier way of doing genetic uh, mapping. And he's done a lot of things like that. So he would probably be able to tell you uh, genetically where they're from, or maybe one tribe is one and one tribe is another, different American, Native American tribes, I mean. So I don't know about that, but that would be a fascinating thing to look at. What was the prophecy that the sons of Japheth would dwell in the tents of the sons of Shem? Um, yeah, that's the one back in Genesis. There's a debate on what that means, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, other than the the uh, the tents of the sons of Shem is in the Middle East, basically, and Japheth which should be Europe, but there there should be some commingling. It might be referring specifically to another prophecy about when Nimrod attacks way back in that time period. Okay. What is your opinion on the theory that Melchizedek, king of Zadok, was actually Jesus Christ? Uh, according, I've actually got a book on uh, Melchizedekian history. According to the scrolls, Melchizedek is a type of, uh, it means king of righteousness. So it's a type of priest in contrast with like the Levitical priesthood. Now there really was a Levi, and that's where I think we got the name for Levites or Leviticus, Le Levitical priesthood. But Melchizedek is actually uh, several of them. So the Melchizedekian priest that blessed Abraham, for instance, was Shem. He was still the Melchizedekian priest at the time. But it goes down through, I think there was only 10 Melchizedekian priests. And then it was uh, turned over to Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the current and only Melchizedekian priest. And that's why when we go through Hebrews, you'll see all these points, several chapters on how the Melchizedekian priesthood is different from the Levitical priesthood. So, for instance, Levitical priesthood, you, it's a mandatory retirement at the age of 50. Levitic, the Melchizedekian priesthood has no mandatory retirement. It's only handed over to someone else uh, with death. And since the Messiah is eternal, he's never going to hand it over to anybody else. So he's permanent. So that's basically what we're, we're talking about there. So in a sense, Messiah is now, but the one that was back there was not. When did humans stop being vegan uh, after they made it with angels, possibly? Um, we don't know for sure. Most people, by just when, when you read the text, sometimes it doesn't say it directly, but you get a feel in the text, something. And that's one of the things that we see in the text that we think is probably the, the case. Uh, there's rabbinical texts that say that back in the days of Adam, uh, they were forbidden to eat meat. So maybe that's true. But as far as Genesis goes, when we get to Genesis chapter 9, when we have the beginning of the Noahide laws and we have the um, the um, rainbow covenant, that kind of stuff, in that, that part there, it talks about from now on, or you can eat meat, just don't eat the blood. So that sounds like they didn't eat meat before the flood, but it could also be saying they, they ate meat and drank blood and you can eat meat but you can't drink blood. So it, it could be a couple of different things. We just know that you're not supposed to eat blood and you can't eat meat. Uh, anything that moves, it said, as long as it's killed and cooked properly. So it would definitely be after that, if that's the case. Rumor has it the stars in order by ancient name explains the gospel. So invested in... Twisting the NM by Haps. Okay. Did Abraham have that re-revealed? According to some of the some of the texts, that was the case. Um, there is a church father that talks about the the Magi were originally taught by Daniel. They were Persians, 
and they came to find the Messiah, but they taught what was called the science of the Magi, this kind of an idea. And so the idea is that when there is a supernova in a constellation, whatever that constellation is supposed to be predicting, that's when it occurs. So if there was, and we don't know this for sure, but if there was a supernova, and that was the star of Bethlehem, if that occurred in the constellation of Coma, Coma represents the child born by the Virgin, which would be the Messiah. So if that occurred, they would say, okay, now we understand there's a Messiah born. Well, Daniel told us he'd be born in around Jerusalem. We'll go to Israel, go to the capital. We'll ask about him. We'll find him. So it's really interesting. Isaac Newton wrote uh, many things. Uh, of course, he's the, 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 the guy credited with founding the, the theorem of gravity. Um, but he also was a Christian. He wrote a lot of commentaries, wrote, wrote some on the book of Revelation, has some really interesting things. He talked about this and he talked about the whole idea that in addition to prophecy, it also, uh, you could also use it to predict earthquakes. And he wrote in one of his texts, uh, the earth, all the earthquakes that would happen in the next hundred years from way back when, and he was accurate. So there's got to be something to that. Uh, we don't know how to recreate it or anything, but it's really interesting to see. So there's got to be something, I think, to the gospel and the stars. I know several of my professors uh, believed in it and talked about it. They didn't teach it necessarily, but 200 angels coming down, 200 animals, 200 humans used for genetic modification, breeding purposes. The 200 thing, I wonder if it's connected. Any other 200 references that you know of aside from these? That's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. Um, yeah, 200 sets of animals. That was the idea. And yeah, why not 300 or 50 or 100? That is interesting. It's almost like each angel tried one. Doesn't say that in the text, but that's interesting. Um, I don't know. That would be something to look at. Thanks for, for mentioning that. We'll have to look at that and see if we can find anything else. Last question. Should I try to reach those in the denomination that believe Michael is the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, yeah, you can definitely try. Um, um, there are, There's probably some, we have a couple of books, like one of our books is Cults and the Trinity. Uh, that has a good explanation of the divinity of Christ. And then there's a section on the Holy Spirit and then cults in the back. Um, but there's a section of verses that might help you. And I think part of that we have in PDF form on the website. So you might be able to just grab it there. But yeah, if, if you can try to do that, just don't let them uh, try to persuade you the other way. Because uh, it's really scary when Jesus says, if you don't believe that I am, you die in your sins. That's spooky. So even if you were going to argue that doesn't mean dying and going to hell, it just means something else. Either way, it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound like he's pleased. So we need to, to focus on that. So, yeah, I, I would I would pray about it. Um, one thing I would probably do, too, if you try to do well, whether you do or not, I think you need to fellowship with a good body of believers. So my recommendation would be if you have a uh, Calvary Chapel around where you're at, good, solid uh, one to do that or a Baptist church or, or something, you know, it's not. And, and like I say, there could be a weird Calvary Chapel. There could be a weird Baptist church. But in general, those denominations are pretty rock solid. So it's, it's really important. What I'm saying is to keep studying with other believers, like-minded believers, and then try to witness. If you just go to one of those other churches, you might get off in something else. Uh, not, not too hard to do. Do you think that we're supposed to find out the evil rituals knowledge and use them for good? I wouldn't think so. Um, in, in that text, uh, having a gun, having a sword, having a security system, knowing herbal medicine, uh, things like that. I think that's all good. And I think the whole idea is that they used the knowledge they had to manipulate people into 
leaving their society. Um, we, you could probably liken it to like you and I, if we would walk into an Amish community, if the Amish community didn't know anything about the outside world, we have these um, horseless carriage things that we call cars, and they just go by themselves. We have these little things in our pockets that we can talk to people thousands of miles away. We can do all these really weird things and we can give them that power if they worship us. Uh, if they'd never heard that before, I would imagine there's a good amount of people that would start doing exactly what you told them. And I think that's the situation that's going on there. On the flip side, though, the rituals were forbidden to do pagan rituals. So anything along those lines, I don't think that we're supposed to do. So we got to be very careful in doing that kind of stuff. Or again, being around that stuff too much. One of the things we really need to do, and I'm, I'm not trying to be legalistic in it, but we really, really need to continue to study at least the New Testament, preferably the whole Bible. A lot of people read the Bible through in a year, that kind of stuff. Just reading, it's not going to do any good either, but you need some good study. But stay in the word. That, that's the main thing. Not even Enoch, but in, in the word specific. Do the months of the Dead Sea calendar, Dead Sea calendar somehow integrate with the astronomical star configurations, Virgo, etc.? They do somehow. I'm not sure. It probably just in the idea that it's reset every leap year, or they, they have a leap. Uh, a leap week system every five to six years there's a leap week cycle so there's probably something like that in the book of enoch in the dead sea scrolls it does mention the star patterns so there's something with star patterns and sun patterns just not not a lunar month what is the origin of the aztec mayan and other calendars I don't know there's a lot of different ones I know some of those are five-day weeks, and sometimes they're five-day weeks and seven-day weeks or 11, something like that. There's all sorts of different ones like that. The Egyptians had a couple of different ones. Uh, so it's really interesting to see that. There's just lots of different uh, types of one. When you think of the fallen angels teaching some form of astrology and whatever, it's really interesting to think that maybe... And again, that's one way to do it. If you could have a different calendar system, a different kind of religion, a different kind of ethics, different kind of, of um, um, power like of metal, you know, uh, armaments, makeup, uh, and then you had a different kind of, you know, all this stuff, it'd be very easy to, to twist it and make you into a type of society you don't shouldn't be. So maybe the calendar had something to do with that. Now, all of these different calendars, I'm sure, are just offshoots later from something. But it is interesting to see that. Basically, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar is 12 months of 30 days. And then outside the, the calendar months, there's four days called Tekufa, which are the solstices and the equinoxes. They're not a full day in any season. So that's a 364-day year which is divisible by seven in exactly 52 weeks. So that's why New Year's is always on a Wednesday. Passover is always on a Tuesday. It's, it's a very simple, very elegant system. But like every calendar, it drifts back. So we have on our Gregorian calendar a leap day every four years. The Jewish calendar, modern Jewish calendar, has a leap month every three or four years. Um, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar has a leap week once every five to six years. And that keeps all the Sabbaths and all those things. And everything is based on a seven day cycle. So it's really interesting. And it, you'd think it would be complicated, but it's probably the easiest calendar to be. Plus all the prophecies are based on Shemitah years, which are, you know, seven year periods. So there's a lot of things in there like that. When the 200 angels mated with women, did they stay in a monogamous relationship? I kind of doubt it. Also, did Azazel mate with a woman? I would think he did. Um, I always wonder if you, if he, you know, if you actually mated with a woman. It depends on what you're wanting to do. 
if 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 I was just lustful, I just would take the woman and you know, for me. If I was trying to create the perfect warrior, the perfect empire or whatever, I would take a bunch of women and a bunch of men and a bunch of whatever. I would scan them, try to figure out what to who, what to mix, mix, mat, bleh, mix and match. So I might, it might not even be lustful at all in my case, if I didn't, if I couldn't make the perfect one, I would be trying to do the genetic manipulation. So are they mad scientist type people or lustful type people or both? So that, that's the question. Some may have been one and some may have been another. Monogamous relationship, I, I doubt it. The, the way it says it in Genesis is they took wives of whomever they chose. That almost makes it sound like, you know, I need a blonde haired, blue eyed woman that has certain genetic things and I, I scan them and there's two people, you know, in here and this one's perfect. She's the one that I want. Well, she said no. Well, I don't really care. I'll take her by force. And then either I'll have my way with her or I will do some genetic whatever or both or whatever. So it, it doesn't sound like it was, it was a love affair kind of thing. It doesn't sound very good at all. Uh, where, of course, it doesn't say that directly either. Where in the Dead Sea Scroll is it recorded that the Messiah would give his life in 32 AD? Looking for a reference for my research. That's in 11Q13. And the way the Dead Sea Scrolls work is... Uh, there's been 12 caves discovered. Well, there's been like 50 some that have been searched through, most of which don't have anything in them. But when you find some sort of written record, it becomes one of the, the Dead Sea Scroll caves. And so there's been 12 of those. So say like you find 10 scrolls in a cave, what they're going to do is say this is cave four. It would be 4Q, so the fourth cave of Qumran, and this is number 12 or something. So in this case, this was the 11th cave they discovered. And this is the 13th scroll from that cave. So it's 11Q13. It talks about, um, um, references the Messiah, calls him the Melchizedekian priest, which the Messiah would be. But this Melchizedekian priest is God. And he comes to pay the penalty for our sin nature. And it says in the text that uh, he pays the penalty, the event where he reconciles us to God by paying for our sin nature occurs one Shemitah after the end of the ninth Jubilee of that particular Ona. So Ona is a 500 year period. You can very easily pick those. So in that 500 year period, there are 10 Jubilees of 50 years each. And so we're up to number nine and then seven past it. So the way the calendars work, they, it ended in 75 AD. So if you go 50 years before, it takes you to 25. But it's exactly one Shemitah after that. So 25 plus 7 is 32. So that's what it would have been. Now, I don't want to argue that it was actually 31 or 32 or 33. That's not really super important. The point being is that they, they predicted when the Messiah would come, that he would be God incarnate that he would die for our sins, that it would start the age of grace, among other things. There's a lot of really interesting things in that scroll. It's too bad that it's fragmented at the end because it was getting into some really interesting end time prophecy. But yeah, 11Q13. I think we have it on our website too. Uh, so you should be able to just grab it. Uh, with regard to meat after the flood, Nephilim, Nephilim was off the menu. What, you know, okay. I'm not sure the meaning here. Um, yeah, well, the, the Nephilim ate, ate all sorts of food and they also ate blood. So that would be forbidden for us anyway, the eating of blood. But um, yeah, after the flood, there shouldn't have been any pre-flood Nephilim left. They should have all been destroyed in the flood. So I'm not exactly sure on that. Where does the Old Testament say that the Messiah would be from Nazareth, as in Matthew? Um, it's in Zechariah chapter, forget the chapter. 
It's the one about the uh, the prophecy about Joshua sitting on the um, on the altar around the seven sided stone. We should have a video on that too. The seven sided stone is an excellent prophecy. You have you have to read the inscription on the stone, but they don't tell you what the inscription is. You have to find it elsewhere. It's a really interesting riddle. But in that particular one, he is the Messiah. He's between the two comings, and he's called the branch. My servant, the branch. And his name is Joshua. So Joshua is the, the English way of saying Yeshua. So he's playing the Messiah who's named Yeshua, who is the branch or from the branch. Nazareth is, uh, <clears throat> in Hebrew, the word Nazarit it means branch. And so when you say that he was supposed to be a Nazarene, that's the prophecy about Yeshua, the branch, or, or Jesus, the Nazarene, from it's chapter three or chapter five. It's the seven-sided stone prophecy. That confused me for a long time because I kept reading that and I'd read other books that flat said it's not there. It's not anywhere in the Old Testament. So I figured it was from Enoch or somewhere and just I'd never found it. But then I realized that it's the, the branch is that particular one. Excellent question. Uh, with Russia actively flying jets to protect the Syrian border from Israel, are we seeing the Ezekiel 38 war beginning to form? It sure looks like it. Again, most of those, like I say, there's only three things that I know of that have a date set with them. That's 32 AD, 1948, 1967 that I know of. All the other prophecies are just stuff happens sometime. And we look at them careful to try to figure out if one's before the other to try to get some sort of an order. But yeah, we understand they come down for some reason to attack Israel. And there's nothing Israel can do about that. They're a superpower. God intervenes and does what is referred to in chapter 38. The war is also mentioned in the book of Gad. So there's a couple extra clues in Gad uh, and then in chapter 38. The interesting thing about that is in Ezekiel 38, it actually says, aren't you the one referring to, to Russia, the Magog battle, the Magogites? Aren't you the one whom my prophets of old spoke of? And I used to read that and go, I don't get this because this is the first time it's mentioned in the Bible, the Magog War. Nobody else before Ezekiel 38 ever mentioned the Magog War. So no, this isn't the one that the prophets of old talked about. But then when you realize Gad mentions it, Gad is referenced in Second Chronicles. He's one of the older prophets. So yeah, he's the one that my old prophets talked about. So probably Gad, maybe Nathan, and a few others. It was really interesting. This may be a stupid question, but are all angels males? Yeah, it doesn't seem like there are any female angels. Now that's different from Nephilim because when you start having kids, some will be male, some will be female, and you'll have these Nephilim tribes. And then, of course, when they all are destroyed, their souls become demons because they're not exactly human. They're not exactly angels. They're half-breeds, halflings, or whatever you want to call it. So Nephilim. So the when people are possessed, for instance, they're not possessed by an angel. They're possessed by a demon. The demon could be a female or from a female form or a male form because they used to be in physical form way back when. But all angels are male. Does the Dead Sea Scrolls say angels will fall again before the end of the church age? Um, it talks about uh, the technology coming back. So it seemed in the book of Enoch, we'll see later, it seems to indicate the punishment for this was so swift and so severe that nobody will ever dare do it again. So like there wouldn't be another incursion of angelic, you know, stuff like that. But it talks about the stuff coming back in the end of time. So the whole idea of doing genetic tampering. So when you cross the line from regular medicine, which is supposed to be herbal, not that regular medicine's bad, the chemicals that may or may not be. But when you cross the line from herbs and chemicals and just things that might help you fight a disease or you know, grow your bone quicker, heal quicker or something. When you cross the line from there to doing something to alter the genetics of a species, that's Nephilim medicine. 
and they talk about that coming back. So somewhere along the line, got to be careful how I say this because I think you guys know what I'm hinting at. But according to the text, somewhere along the line, we do the same thing they did back then and we start messing with genetics. And it always ends badly. Plus the fact it's a forbidden thing. God's basically like, you make your own creations, leave mine alone. You don't tamper with things. So um, definitely before the church age ends, we have Nephilim medicine back. We have those weird experiments back. Um, as far as actual angels doing something, I don't know. That's, that's what exactly happened. And we'll get to it too in the study. But after the flood, there wasn't a second incursion as far as the texts talk about, but they talk about Canaan going up and finding Zidon, going over to Mount Hermon, finding ancient records, and then trying to emulate what he found in the records. Next thing you know, there's giants in the land of Canaan that Joshua and Moses have to fight. So apparently he was successful. So it's, you know, if it's a breeding type program and you realize if I take 200 donkeys and 200 horses, That'll make 200 mules. A handful of the mules could probably reproduce or a few of them. And so we can, you know, you just have to keep doing your stuff. And then you mix those with this and those with this. And then, you know, it wouldn't be hard to follow directions. It'd be impossible for you and I to figure it out. But if you have a list in front of you, you could probably follow it. Apparently they did. That's why one of the things that the the um, one of the important parts that the scrolls talk about is in the end times of their age and our age. So first coming and second coming, things get weird. The idea is given not in so many words, but the idea is that the counselors will start being secular. You're OK. I'm OK. They try to make you feel better instead of saying just stop sinning and you won't have to worry about it. And then the, the doctors, instead of just fixing the problem with herbs, begin to tamper with Nephilim medicine, which is genetics. And that causes problems. So in that time period, you're supposed to pull back and be careful. And so you're supposed to have in your church, the way they describe it, your church or your synagogue, you have a pastor who is the kind of pe person we think is you know, the head pastor. He loves you. He studies. He counsels. Everything's great. You got really good counselors that are focused on stopping sinning and fixing it that way. And then you have herbal medicine people that you can go to instead of doctors that are trying to mess with genetics. And it's interesting. One of the texts actually says if you don't have a pastor, uh, a counselor, a prophecy expert, and an herbal medicine guy, you don't have a church. It's like you can't have a church without some of the basic principles of a church. You, you don't necessarily have to have a song leader and a choir, although that's kind of important too to, you know, praise the Lord. So it's really interesting in that sense. Is there a mention of the pre-trib rapture in the Didache? Yes. Yeah, it's actually uh, really interesting in that respect. It talks about when the Lord comes back, and I forget the exact things, but there's and it's in chapter 16. And it talks about, um, I forget how it says it, that you don't know when the Lord comes back. So it's like an unknown thing. So it's not mid or post. It's got to be pre sometime. And then it talks about when that event happens that you're glorified, you know, or you become totally holy, which is our glorified body. So it's referring to that directly. So it's actually in the Didache. It's in the Testament of the Lord. It's in uh, mentioned by Eusebius and Ignatius, even though Eusebius is trying to say you, it's got to be confused because we don't believe that. So it's really interesting to see all those kind of things. There's several church fathers also that are pre-trib. Um, Irenaeus, Hippolytus, Cyprian makes a comment, uh, Ephraim the Syrian. So there's several of them like that. Would rare steak count as eating blood? I don't think so. Um, I would say be careful because if it's rare, you, you're more likely to get a disease than if it's cooked well done. So cooking it well done is probably safer. But I think the concept I, I, it seems like a lot of the drinking of the blood thing goes back to some weird 
ritual. Um, and I think it, it's debated on exactly what the Noahide law means about the eating the blood. At the very least, the, the animal should be killed in a humane way and it should be cooked well done, uh, or maybe not well done, but cooked uh, so that you don't have any kind of contaminants. And then, of course, you could still take a piece of meat and offer it to Zeus or something and make a weird ritual out of it. But I've often wondered if the eating the blood thing was more of a satanic type ritual than it was just a health thing. Probably both. It's a good question, though. Okay, we'll go ahead and stop there for tonight. Excellent questions. Um, and so we will continue to do this. Next week, we'll come back. We'll revisit real quickly chapters 6, 7, and 8. And I want to take you to uh, the Book of Giants from the Dead Sea Scrolls that gives you more information on what 6, 7, and 8 give. So 6, 7, and 8 gives you the basic history. And then in the next Dead Sea Scroll, we'll have some very specific data on how you make Nephilim. It's not enough that you and I could recreate it, thank the Lord, but it's enough that we can look at it and say, well, if that's true, it means it would have to be through what we would call genetic manipulation. You know, it's like, because sometimes you have a, a weird medieval document that says, how do you make a giant or a Nephilim? Well, three oranges, two grapes, and a banana, and mix it together and it'll work. Well, you and I both know that's not going to work. This is a made up fairy tale. Uh, but when you got people that don't know anything about genetics that use language about genetics, and if we did it that way, I don't know if I would be successful, but that would be the only way that it would really work. That's just spooky. So that's, that's really interesting. So we'll go ahead and, and we'll look at that next time. So thank you guys. And we will see you next week. God bless.